Hello and welcome to our eighth and final session in this uh, teaching series called Praying with the Gospel of John. Um, uh, tonight we're going to be looking at the last two chapters of the Gospel, chapters 20 and 21, uh, which uh, are the resurrection narratives, the risen Jesus appearing to his disciples. Uh, before we do that, let's begin with a word of prayer. O God, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection, delivered us from the power of our enemy. Grant us so to die daily to sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his resurrection. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. If you've been with us since the start of this course, you'll remember that in the first session we looked at the prologue of the Gospel, the first 18 verses of chapter 1, and we saw that the author, John, or the evangelist here, was uh, kind of opening the curtains and allowing us to get a glimpse of who Jesus really was. Uh, before we encounter Jesus in the gospel. So the readers already know who Jesus is. And now after the prologue and he's been, he's been revealed to us, uh, now we get to watch as other characters come along and meet Jesus. So in the second session, we looked at three different uh, characters encountering Jesus and watching them uh, coming to faith. And so, um, uh, we have a similar situation here in the 20 and 21st chapter of John, where um, uh, different people are going to uh, encounter the risen Jesus and gradually come to believe uh, in his risen life. And uh, so we will uh, visit some uh, scenarios of different apostles and uh, disciples of Jesus um, becoming exposed to the empty tomb, uh, seeing his garments laying in the tomb, uh, meeting angels or whatever it is, and uh, having the experience of coming to believe that he has risen from the dead. So uh, in John's account of, um, of the resurrection appearances in chapter 20, we have first of all uh, Simon Peter and the beloved disciple in the first uh, 10 verses, then the reaction of Mary Magdalene in verses 11 through 18, the reaction of Jesus' disciples as they're gathered in the upper room in John 20, 19 to 23, and the reaction of Thomas in chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. And we'll see that in these different reactions, there are different rates of response to him. Some come quickly to believe, some are not ready to believe and uh, uh, come along at a, at a different pace. So there's a different ways in which they come to recognize Jesus as the risen Lord and uh, at different paces. So uh, let's look first at uh, John chapter 20, the opening story, uh, is similar to the gospel accounts in that uh, the other gospel accounts all talk about women coming to the tomb. And here John uh, has not a group of women, but a solitary woman. Uh, Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb early in the morning and she sees that the stone has been rolled away. Now John mentions uh, early on the first day of the week while it was still dark. So here again, we have John making use of that lightness and dark imagery. It's still dark. The light of, hasn't dawned on them yet that Jesus is risen. In fact, Mary comes to the tomb. She doesn't investigate inside the tomb here, or there's no mention of that. She doesn't apparently see the garment. She simply sees that the stone has been rolled away, and she makes the assumption that the body has been stolen. 
So her first impulse is a kind of a negative one. They've taken the body, and we don't know uh, where they've laid. So she returns uh, uh, back to the city, and she looks for and finds the beloved disciple and Peter, and he, she tells him, uh, uh, she tells them oh, what she's seen, that the tomb is open and the stone rolled away. The tomb appears to be empty. The body is gone. And so uh, what happens next is uh, in this first section, Mary is almost like a, a just a little introductory piece there. This is not about her coming to encounter Jesus. We'll get that in the next session. But this is about Simon Peter and the beloved disciple who set off for the tomb in a kind of a foot race. And uh, the traditionally, the beloved disciple has been understood to be a, a young person at this time, and he outraces Peter to the tomb. But he pauses at the entrance and doesn't go into the empty tomb, allowing Peter to catch up and preserve the tradition that Peter is the first one to enter the empty tomb. Peter uh, enters the tomb. He sees the garments laid out, uh, the garments that were wrapped around the body in one place, and the the, gar the linens that were wrapped around the head uh, slightly apart in another way. And so uh, he, he doesn't know what to make of them. The beloved disciple comes into the tomb after Peter, and uh, the Gospel writer says um, he believed and so we read in uh, verse 6, uh, Simon Peter came uh, following the beloved disciple, and Simon Peter went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. Seeing and believing is such a strong theme in, in John's Gospel. Remember how in the healing of the blind man, uh, Jesus equated uh, seeing uh, with believing. And he said that the Pharisees were blind. They couldn't see because they could not come to believe and accept the things that Jesus was saying. Whereas the blind men came to see, not only physically, but spiritually came to see that Jesus was was uh, the Lord and the Messiah. And so uh, uh, we have seeing and believing. Here the, the beloved disciple is said, he saw and believed. And, uh, and then there's a proviso here. It says, for as yet they did not understand the scriptures that he must rise from the dead. So this is kind of excusing Peter. It doesn't say that Peter didn't believe, but it also doesn't say that he did believe. And uh, the gospel writer explains that uh, the the other disciples uh, uh, haven't they haven't yet grasped the scripture. They don't understand yet that Jesus is to rise from the dead. And so these two disciples return home. One has believed, and the other uh, we don't know yet. <laughs> He's still trying to figure out what has happened. Now, when they return home, uh, that clears the set for Mary to come back, uh, as we have depicted in this icon of Mary Magdalene encountering the risen Jesus. Mary Magdalene comes back to the tomb. She enters the, uh, the empty tomb and she sees two angels, one seated at, at the head and one seated at the feet of where Jesus would have laid. And uh, these two angels ask her, whom she is looking for. And she once again uh, repeats her story that uh, they have taken the body and I don't know where they've laid it. Um, and so uh, uh, she turns around and uh, presumably outside the tomb sees a figure and she uh, speaks to this uh, man in the garden and not knowing that it's Jesus. She presumes that he is the gardener, and she asks him, uh, if you can tell, tell me where uh, they have taken the body, I'll come and take care of it and prepare it for its final burial. And so um, uh, she is uh, uh, speaking to this man as if he's a stranger. And the thing that 
brings her awareness, uh, awakens her to the fact that this is the risen Christ, is Jesus calling her name. Jesus simply says, Mary. And uh, immediately, uh, she a flood of recognition sweeps over her, and she uh, knows who it is that is speaking to her. This recalls, of course, the, the imagery that we had in John chapter 10 of the Good Shepherd, the one who calls his sheep by name, the one whose voice is familiar to the sheep. The sheep follow him, he calls them out by name, and they follow him because they know his voice. Strangers and uh, false shepherds, uh, they don't recognize the voice, and so they don't follow. So here is one of Jesus' sheep, as it were, uh, recognizing Jesus by his voice. When he says her name, she responds, Rabboni, which is a kind of affectionate term for a teacher. And um, she recognizes him and is uh, uh, amazed to see him. She, uh, she returns to, uh, to the disciples and, uh, uh, and hence has earned the reputation of uh, being an apostle to the apostles. She returns to them with the good news that Jesus has risen. She says, I have seen the Lord. And she testifies to them. So she's the first one to witness, to actually encounter uh, the risen Jesus. And she becomes, uh, she becomes the one who testifies to the fact that he has risen. Um, so uh, now we move to a, a section in which uh, Jesus uh, makes a second appearance. Uh, this all has taken place with Simon Peter and uh, the beloved disciple and Mary Magdalene has all taken place on Easter morning. Now the scene shifts to the evening of the day of Easter and the disciples are gathered here together. Now in spite of having received Mary Magdalene's report that he is, uh, that she has seen the Lord, uh, they are still uh, in fear. They're in a locked room uh, meeting together uh, for fear of their life. And, uh, and so Jesus appears to them in this room uh, um, and he, uh, he gives them a greeting of peace. Peace be, be to you. This recalls to his uh, charge in the Last Supper uh, after the Last Supper, in his discourse, he assures them that he is giving them his peace. And it's not a peace as the world gives. It's a different quality of uh, his abiding with him, uh, uh, with them, will, will be, uh, um, they will share in his peace. So here again, he, he greets them with peace be with you. And of course, they're amazed to, to see him and he shows them his hands and his side. Uh, he does this, uh, of course, to remove any question of his identity. They recognize these wounds um, and uh, they know that it is him. And then he, uh, 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 John tells us that uh, when, when he showed his hands and his side to them, they came to believe. They saw that it was the Lord. And so they come to, come to believe that he has risen from the dead. Uh, Jesus then uh, uh, offers them his peace once again. And this is not so much as a greeting, but as a part of his commissioning. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I now send you into the world. So just as the Father, in the Father's love, has sent Jesus into the world to testify to the Father, to witness to the Father, to reveal the Father's nature uh, to those who live below, uh, Jesus coming from above, um, uh, so too they now are commissioned to be sent into the world by Jesus. And uh, they will have the same task of uh, bringing, uh, uh, revealing God to others, of uh, uh, teaching about the real nature of God and bringing light and life into the world, just as Jesus does. 
And uh, so he gives them a similar charge to the charge that he himself has had uh, from the Father and sends them into the world. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, the Holy Spirit cannot come in John's Gospel until Jesus is crucified. And so now we have on the on the evening of his resurrection, him breathing on the disciples and telling them to uh, receive the Holy Spirit. This is uh, John's moment of Pentecost here, where the disciples received the Spirit in order to fulfill the commission that he's given to them, sending them into the world. And in addition to receiving the Spirit, he gives them the power uh, to forgive uh, or to um, to hold on to sin. So he says that you can uh, release people from their sins or you can bind them uh, to their sins. Once again, we have uh, a hearkening back to this notion of realized eschatology. Remember where Jesus coming creates a kind of a crisis of faith for people. And uh, they have to choose whether to accept him and to accept his words and accept who he says he is and uh, believe, or whether they choose to reject that and, uh, and choose not to believe. So this, uh, this provokes an immediate crisis in the here and now. It's not some future judgment. It's a realized uh, judgment here, a judgment uh, that results from their choice of whether to believe or not believe. And so here uh, the disciples are uh, going into the world and their presence will evoke that same kind of crisis. Will people receive their message and believe or will they turn away and not believe? Will they prefer darkness to light? So the disciples are going to be also be uh, in the position of uh, creating this crisis of faith, uh, uh, believing or not believing in the people that they minister to. And so uh, Jesus gives them the power to forgive or the power to bind. If you forgive uh, people's sins, their sins are forgiven, he tells them. And um, um, so uh, they are prepared uh, to be sent out. The, the Synoptic Gospels also have uh, a commissioning of the disciples by uh, Jesus. Uh, um, uh, by the resurrected Jesus, who, who sends them out into the world. Uh, John's is a, is a little bit unique in that uh, um, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit here, and we have this, uh, as I have been sent by the Father, so I send you. That kind of parallel um, comparison again between Jesus and the Father and Jesus and his disciples. Just as Jesus is sent by the Father, so the disciples are sent by Jesus. And that connection is the connection that we've seen over and over again in the Gospels. Now, uh, uh, one disciple is missing from this gathering, and that is Thomas. And when the disciples report to them, to Thomas, that they have seen the Lord and that he has uh, commissioned them, he's sending them into the world with this mission and that he's breathed on them, the Holy Spirit, Thomas cannot accept it. And he says he won't believe until he sees the wounds, until he can actually touch the, uh, the wounds in Jesus' hand and side. And uh, so he is not able to believe. We might have a little sympathy for Thomas. Thomas is referred to here as the twin. Thomas, who was called the twin, uh, maybe as a twin, he's familiar with mistaken identity, uh, being mistaken uh, for his, his twin, perhaps. Uh, but he is he's skeptical. And we've seen him a couple of times previously in the gospel where he's also, uh, it's been hard to convince Thomas. Uh, and uh, he's been a little bit uh, reluctant uh, to, to go along with things. So um, here we have Thomas being Thomas. He's not, uh, he's not ready to believe. 
And so the following week, one week later, at the same time and in the same place, presumably, again in a locked room, the disciples are gathered. And this time Thomas is with him, with them. And so here Jesus appears to the group and he appears especially to Thomas. And he challenges Thomas. He says, you know, I understand that you don't believe. You don't believe on the basis of their word and their witness, their testimony, or Mary Magdalene's testimony for that matter. And instead you want physical proof of uh, actually being able to touch. So he says, okay, he's conceding to that request. And it doesn't say that Thomas takes him up on that request. In a way, it's like uh, Jesus prefers if you uh, believe without the, the, the tangible evidence. And so it's, it's almost like a challenge that he gives to Thomas. And Thomas responds to the challenge by saying, okay, no, I believe. Um, but uh, uh, you'll see that depicted in different ways in some art uh, of the scene. You see Thomas reaching out to touch. But here the, there's no mention in the scripture passage itself that he actually does reach out and touch the wounds as soon as Jesus appears and challenges his, his uh, unbelief, he, uh, he concedes and, and says, uh, my Lord and my God, he recognizes Jesus as the risen one, the Lord. And uh, so it's ironic in a way that the one who has the most doubts, <laughs> namely Thomas, uh, is the one who gives the strongest profession of faith in the gospel. My Lord and my God, he calls Jesus. Um, so uh, Jesus, uh, uh, we have these different people coming to faith. Uh, the disciples come to faith when John, uh, the beloved disciple, comes to faith when he sees the, the garments um, uh, on the, in, in the empty tomb. Uh, Mary Magdalene comes to faith when as she hears uh, Jesus' voice speaking her name. Um, these disciples come to faith when Jesus appears to them in the upper room and shows them his wounds. And then Thomas eventually comes to faith as well when Jesus appears uh, to him and challenges his, uh, his disbelief and offers him the chance to uh, examine his wounds. So uh, uh, the chapter ends with, uh, with a praise for those who have come to believe but who have not seen, who have not seen the empty tomb, who have not seen the garments rolled up, who have not seen the Lord appearing, uh, standing in the garden or appearing in the upper room, who have not been able to reach out and, and witness or examine or touch his wounds. And so uh, the, the final uh, acclamation or praise is given to those who have come to believe, who have not had the opportunity to actually see any of these things. And uh, that would be most of the people that are now reading this gospel, feeling uh, uh, perhaps a wishing that they had been able to be there. But Jesus says, blessed are you if you have, um, have come to believe and uh, not been able to see. Now, there the gospel draws to a natural close, which we uh, recognized before. Uh, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. And John neatly wraps up the end of the gospel there. And then along comes chapter 21, which uh, strikes us as a bit odd. And scholars will tell us that this is an epilogue. This is an additional, this is an editorial addition to the gospel, possibly to provide more information or pr provide some correctives uh, to the community. Uh, it seems rather disjointed from chapter 20, and we'll, we'll see why. It looks like an, an added piece um, but there are some puzzling questions that are made, uh, raised when you look at the two of them together. 
it seems that the the redactor or the editor or whoever it is that uh, penned this 21st chapter and tried to add it to the gospel tries to make it connect with the with the uh, chapter 20 accounts for example in the first verse it says he starts out after these things in other words after the appearances in chapter 20 Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. So now uh, these are located in Galilee, and the Sea of Tiberias is another name for the Sea of Galilee. And it is in, uh, located in the northern part of Israel in the region called Galilee. All of the appearances in chapter 20 take place in Jerusalem where Jesus was uh, crucified and where he was buried. So those resurrection accounts, the upper room, are all taking place in Jerusalem. Now we find Jesus in chapter 21 in Galilee and uh, showing himself to his disciples. And so there seems to be a connection in verse uh, uh, verse 1 of chapter 21 where the, the redactor or editor says, well, after these things in chapter 20, then Jesus also showed himself in Galilee. So now we have an account that takes place in, uh, on, the, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And, uh, uh, but it, it raises interesting questions. So if, if the disciples in chapter 20 uh, encountered the risen Lord, came to believe that he had risen from the dead, actually saw him and talked to him, actually received from him a commission to go out into the world and to, to, be, to be his ministers and communicators. And he, he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. It's very peculiar to find them in the very next chapter, just going back to their old work of being fishermen. So what are they doing in Galilee? And why does Peter say, let's go fishing? And they all decide to go fishing. Now, here there are, the, the, the gospel writer uh, mentions that there are seven of them here. There are seven disciples in this scene. Uh, one of them is Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee. He was encountered, we encountered him in the very first chapter uh, as one of the early uh, early. Uh, people that were interested in Jesus in chapter one of John's gospel. So he's here. He is not one of the 12, but he's here. Then four of the 12 are here. There's Simon Peter is here. Thomas, who's called the twin, and the two sons of Je Zebedee, which are James and John. So James, John, Peter, and Thomas are here. And then two other disciples, it says, they, they aren't given names. Uh, two others of his disciples are with him. So there are seven in all. Simon Peter says, let's go fishing. And they go out fishing and they don't catch anything all night long. What are they doing? Why are they fishing? They've been given this great commission. They've seen the risen Lord. The Holy Spirit has been breathed on them. Why do they return to Galilee and then get in a boat and go fishing? Uh, it's a, it's a, a puzzling question. Uh, but just uh, after daybreak, then, uh, as they have endured this night of uh, um, fishing without any sort of catch, uh, they see a stranger on the, sh on the shore. And uh, the stranger calls out to them and asks them if they've had any success and they admit that they haven't caught anything all night. And then the stranger tells them to, to put their nets out again. And at this time, they, they haul in a huge catch of fish. Uh, John lists 153 large fish were caught here. There doesn't seem to be any particular significance in this number. Uh, other than just, it's a sign of abundance. Uh, so a large catch of many large, uh, large fish um, to show that uh, how fruitful they can be uh, when Jesus is directing them. And so a sign of the, the potential for their ministry uh, if they follow uh, Jesus' uh, directives. So um, the a huge uh, catch of fish. And once uh, they start hauling these fish in, the, 
the disciple whom Jesus loved. So that's one of the other two unnamed disciples. One of them is the beloved disciple who's here. The disciple whom Jesus loved, in verse 7, said to Peter, it is the Lord. So with the huge catch of fish, the disciple comes to realize that the stranger on the shore is not just anyone, it's Jesus who's told them to put their nets out and they've had this uh, terrific catch of fish. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he uh, fastens uh, his, his um, clothes around him and dives into the sea to go to, to, go to Jesus. And the other disciples follow in the boat, uh, dragging this huge catch of fish up onto the shore. When they get to the shore, they find that Jesus has prepared a breakfast for them. He's built a charcoal fire, and he is uh, cooking fish and uh, has some bread with him for a meal for them. He asks them to, to bring him some more of the fish that they've just caught, and uh, he's preparing a meal for them, and they join him there. Um, Simon Peter uh, um, uh, and the rest of the disciples, Jesus says, uh, come and have breakfast, which is a nice touch. It's a, kind of a very human thing to do and a very hospitable and warm thing to have prepared breakfast for them and to invite them now to join him. And here, uh, here finally in verse 12, we, we see the recognition that some of the other disciples now are catching on. They're believing that this is Jesus. It says, now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And so Jesus uh, took bread, uh, distributed it, uh, distributed the fish. And this is a familiar scene. Jesus has shared many meals with him. With, with his disciples. And so it's possible that just in the context of this shared meal, um, they recognize that this is the Lord, in fact. Uh, just as the two uh, disciples traveling to Emmaus recognize uh, the, that Jesus is who he is uh, um, uh, when he breaks bread with them. So here in verse 12, we have an acknowledgement that they have come to believe. Um, and then uh, the, the redactor or whoever is writing this 21st chapter uh, tries to make another tie to chapter 20 by saying this was the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So we've had two previous appearances to the disciples, both in the upper room, one without Thomas, one with Thomas. And this then is the third. But it seems unusual that they have a difficult time recognizing him. And uh, it's only after the great catch of fish that the beloved disciple is aware, for he's the first to become aware that this is Jesus. And the other disciples gradually become convinced as he invites them to share in this meal uh, with them. So uh, it's, it's a peculiar story and it raises questions about why are they here? And uh, if they had such a powerful experience, especially Thomas, who's named here, had the very powerful personal experience of being with Jesus and, and seeing his wounds and uh, becoming convinced, professing him as his Lord and God. And now Thomas uh, seems, it, it, it's almost as if these disciples have never seen the risen Jesus. So it's peculiar to have these two chapters uh, together because of the, the questions that they, they raise. Uh, next follows a, a, a discussion between Jesus and Simon Peter. Uh, you remember that in the, in the, not uh, too long ago, just a few chapters ago, when Jesus was on trial at the house of uh, Annas, the high priest, uh, uh, Peter was in the courtyard, and Peter, on three uh, three separate occasions, um, denied knowing Jesus or denied being one of his followers. And so now here they're gathered around this breakfast on the shore, and Jesus asks Peter the question, Peter, do you love me? And uh, this is a particularly Johannine question. 
because love is such a central theme in John's Gospel. And the chief quality or the chief characteristic of a disciple is someone who loves Jesus. So it's entirely appropriate for Jesus to ask Peter, Peter, do you love me? Are you really a disciple? Uh, um, uh, reflecting back on his threefold denial, Jesus asks him three times, do you love me? Gives him a chance to affirm, yes, Lord, I love you. And here we see a kind of chastened Peter uh, saying, Lord, you know that I love you. Um, uh, gone is the kind of boastful Peter that we had uh, back in uh, the earlier chapters where Peter says, uh, even if everybody else denies you, I won't deny you. I'm going to be with you and I'll go with you to the death, uh, he says at the Last Supper. But um, of course, that later that same night, he fails Jesus uh, by betraying or by denying him three times. So here is a kind of a chastened Peter who is uh, more humble and said, Lord, uh, you know that I love you. Um, and, uh, but he's not as boastful and as confident as before. Jesus responds to his three statements of love by saying, tend my sheep, uh, feed my lambs. So now we've gone from uh, the imagery of a large catch of fish, which is more of an image that's suitable to uh, mission and evangelization of bringing in a large catch of fish. Now we go to uh, the imagery of a shepherd, uh, tend my sheep, care for my lambs. And so this is more of a pastoral image. It has to do with the care of those who have come to believe now uh, the pastoral responsibility. So Peter is both an evangelist and a pastor. Uh, he's re and, and Jesus is not only forgiving him, the threefold profession of love uh, compensates for his threefold denial, and Peter is forgiven. He's not only forgiven, but he's also reinstated uh, to his role as a leader in the, uh, in the community of Jesus' disciples and followers. And here he is recognized in the fourth gospel uh, as having been given that position of leadership by Jesus. Now the fourth gospel is uh, unusual in its, in its treatment of authority. Generally, the Johannine, uh, uh, both the gospel and the letters reflect a kind of distrust of authority and of church hierarchy. And, uh, and so it's unusual here for them to be recognizing uh, Peter's authority. But, uh, but it's interesting that it comes about by uh, Jesus asking him, do you love me? And so for John, it's, uh, uh, it's not so much that a, a person in authority has power and can make decisions and tell people what to do. It's more this person in authority is uh, one who loves Jesus and who loves Jesus' sheep and is willing to take care of them, even lay down his life for them. And so there's this element of loving service in the, in the position of uh, uh, being a pastor or a shepherd for this community. Um, they are not to uh, lord it over others, um, uh, but they are to be, as Jesus was, a, a caring and loving shepherd. So even though there's human authority being recognized here and Peter given a position of authority and affirmed in that position of authority, there's still the emphasis on this personal relationship, this intimate relationship and bond between Jesus and his disciples. That is a bond of love and of intimacy. Um, <clears throat> so after he has uh, three, three times asked uh, Peter if he loves him, and three times told him to tend uh, the flock and the sheep, uh, Jesus then warns him of his impending death. He says, uh, uh, you're going to be bound and led where you don't want to go. And of course, he's speaking of uh, Peter's death. Peter, uh, the tradition has uh, died in the, in the 60s. Uh, he was put to death by the Roman Emperor Nero. And so we have, uh, uh, he was crucified as Jesus was, but uh, tradition has that he asked to be crucified upside down. 
So um, that tradition is known by now. This is some 30 years after that. Jesus, Peter has already died. And so the gospel writer writing back to this time before Peter had died uh, uh, has Jesus uh, warning Peter that this is going to be his fate. Uh, Peter uh, looks at the beloved disciple and asks Jesus, well, what about him? And uh, this is to show that uh, uh, Peter's path is a path of martyrdom, but the beloved disciple's path is not to be a path toward martyrdom. And uh, the beloved disciple uh, uh, presumably was told by Jesus that he would not die before Jesus had returned again, or at least that's the understanding of some members of the community. But we've seen in this gospel over and over again how uh, human beings uh, um, trapped in, below here have a difficult time understanding things. And so this also proves to be a misunderstanding. And, and here the, uh, the writer uh, corrects that misunderstanding. Perhaps he's correcting the mis misunderstanding because the beloved disciple too has finally died. Uh, but he says Jesus didn't say to him that he would not die before Jesus had come again. Uh, he just said, if it is my will for you to remain or to abide um, <clears throat> until I come, what is that to you, Peter? It's a good word for us um, to uh, listen to Jesus say, uh, when we're, we're tempted to say, well, what about him or what about her? Or compare ourselves with others and Jesus just focuses right in on us and says, um, what is that to you? You just follow me. He says that to Peter. Don't worry about him. What is that to you? You follow me. You follow the path that I'm uh, laying out for you. <clears throat> and so we come to the end of the, the story here. Um, in chapter 21, and we have this testimony at the end in verse 24. This is the disciple, referring to this beloved disciple. This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and has written them, and we know that his testimony is true. Um, and so uh, there, this gospel, uh, this author is recognizing too that this gospel comes uh, in response to the, um, the testimony, the witness, the eyewitness experience of the beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved. So it's whereas Peter may have been the most important figure in a number of Christian communities, for this particular community, the Johannine community, the beloved disciple is the one who is really the spiritual leader of this community. It's his interpretation of who Jesus is. It's his developing theology that has, uh, has characterized this whole gospel. He may be the author of it in a literal sense, or he may simply be uh, the inspiration behind it. Uh, but, the, but the whole gospel points to him and uh, says that he is the, the authority in this particular Christian community, early Christian community, um, that formed up around him and that um, listened to his uh, wit eyewitness account of who Jesus was. So that uh, brings us to the end of our uh, discussion of this gospel. It's a gospel of love, God's love for us, uh, Jesus' love for his disciples, Jesus, the good shepherd, we the sheep who hear his voice and follow where he leads us. And uh, uh, we are so grateful for you joining us uh, over the course of this study and ask God's continued blessings on you as you continue to pray and live the gospel.